When I think of um, Francis of Assisi, part of me is just speechless. What do you say about somebody who literally is a medieval man prefigured the entire Renaissance? What do you about, say about somebody who literally changed permanently the culture of both Western Europe and the church? One guy who died before the age of 50, who didn't travel very much, and yet people were, people flocked to him. I don't quite understand it, and I don't entirely know what Jesus is asking of me through his witness. Because you see, the collect steps takes us literally right into the deep of it. When, he, when the phrase shows up, renouncing the vanities of this world. You know, I have to tell you, I'm not sure I even know what that is. You know, it reminds me of a story where two little fish are swimming in the stream and a big older fish swims by and the big fish says to the two little fish, how's the water today, boys? Little fish swim along and one turns to the other and says, What's water? We don't know the soup we are in. We don't know what is vanity and what is not. I mean, for Francis, renouncing the vanities of this world looked like this. This is Jesus in a monk's head. And that the thrust of Jesus' life was imitatio Christi, the imitation of Christ. And out of that, taking on poverty, chastity, obedience, a willingness to give everything of who he was completely in the service of Jesus Christ. And challenging, and often quite roughly, others to follow the same. In fact, a part of the agony of his later years, meaning his early 40s, was he felt like his order was getting soft. They couldn't bear the level of poverty that he asked of the men in his order, the women under Claire, and that which literally spread across Western Europe. And so, <laughs> because we're talking about it, I have to have the courage to say, okay, Jesus, what do you say? You know, I hope any of you who are preachers know, we can never, ever take the scripture as a kind of armchair exercise of exposition to, to listeners. God, have mercy. Instead, I said, okay, Lord, what, how am I to approach what it is that you are asking? And what I thought of was a kind of cycle that actually proves true in me and other lives of Christians I know. And it <coughs> goes by leaving, cleaving, serving. Leaving, cleaving, serving. Leaving. This is, this is what leaving looks like. <laughs> May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Out of the Galatian reading this morning. In other words, facing the fact that if I'm to be a follower of Jesus, the, world, the cross of Christ literally stands like a stake between me and the vanities of the world to which I find so extraordinarily alluring. And that it's right there. It's right here. It literally surrounds me like a fortress. But because of God's kindness, it can feel permeable. I can feel like maybe I can sort of reach through it in some way and grab a piece of the world, a piece of the vanity of the world, 
just to make me feel a little better about myself, because that's almost always the motivation. And yet, I face the fact that it is vain that to love the world is actually to be an enemy of God. Mm -hmm. And so it's not easy, and I understand that the temptation is quite honestly either self-centered or genuinely demonic, or some combination of both. <clears throat> and that that, including the fear of it, is a part of what causes me to cleave even more deeply to Jesus himself. Because I know enough to know that my job is not to be allured by the world. It's to serve Jesus in the world. There's a huge difference. And that my calling actually is not to take on a monastic road. Although I have tremendous admiration for those who do. Because they continue to remind of that with which I most deeply wrestle, which is, what does it mean to be me as servant of Jesus in the world, rather than comfortable citizen in the world? Again, you see, there's an extraordinarily, extraordinary difference. And so I turn to him who is so much more patient with me than I am with myself. And to know the delight of his love actually works in me the kind of childlikeness. I can't make it happen for myself. But the kind of childlikeness that Jesus says in the gospel. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. What are the things that will reveal to these who are children? It's actually God's judgment on the world. Mm -hmm. For if the deeds of power had been done in Sodom, they would have remained to this day. But I tell you that on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. That's what precedes the tenderness of that verse. In other words, when I see Jesus in his splendor, in his beauty, in his glory, in the depths of what I know, in the forgiveness of sin, and the promise of eternal life. It is exactly there that I see the world more accurately as a system under judgment. That to step into actually puts me in a place of peril. And yet I also know that to be with him, to be in his presence, even to be alone with him, and to know those delights are meant to be temporary respites by which I am empowered to go and serve, not as a servant of the world, but a servant of Jesus to the world. And that that actually is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Christ. In that sense, the words of Jeremiah are just as true for us as it was for the nation of Israel. He, talking about good King Josiah, he judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it went well. Is this not what it means to know me, says the Lord? Mm -hmm. Meaning to be there, to serve those, particularly those in the deepest need, actually is the best reflection of what happens but I am cleaved to Jesus. Because again, for Francis and for the followers of Christ, there is a kind of revamping of what happens in terms of the way we see the world. And then what God is doing right out of the Song of Mary. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. And therefore, pandering to the mighty admiring them, wanting to be like them, actually is a sign of my inability to believe what I see in the face of Jesus. My unwillingness to be like him and to be with him. 
And so God has to deal with me. So you see, that's the cycle. Because it's not a one-off event. I am always being called to leave. I am always being called to cleave. I'm always being called to serve in the very world that I have renounced. Hmm. And that that is the cycle. That is what to me looks most Christ-like about Francis. I'll never be an Italian monk. I'm married with five children. God willing, that's not going to change anytime soon. God has put me in a position where he has called me to serve, none of which, however, are an excuse to say no to the leaving, cleaving, serving. So let's get challenged. Let's not turn away from the radical nature of this witness. But to ask really profoundly, Jesus, what do you want to say to me from the little flowers that St. Francis has left behind?